a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this incredibly cool episode, Chris Matthew joins us again to talk about his new film, The Forbidden Documentary, Occult Louisiana, episode one, Older Than History. May or may not include your boy here, by the way. So all the ways, of course, to find him located down in the show description, all the ways to find us and all the important things are located down there as well. Stick around for after the episode for all of our affiliate link announcements. But without any further ado, let's get to it with Chris Matthew. Chris Matthew, welcome the fuck back, man. It's so good to see you. Hey, man. Thank you so much for having me back. I love visiting with you. I thank you so much for having me at your place to to do my docu trip. And thank you for having me on. This is great. I love our conversations. It was a fucking honor to host you and Jennifer and your pup. How's everybody doing at the house, by the way? Everybody's good, man. Can't complain. Living life and uh, just excited about everything that's going on right now. And we're living in very fun times. Oh, the fuck. Yes, we are. And uh, we're going to get to your documentary. Um, I want to know what you think the funnest thing about these times are. I think the funnest things about these times is the that the fact that I have realize that I don't have to participate in any of the bullshit and my life can be as beautiful and, and wonderful and magical as I want it to be. And there's really no limits to that. So that is one of my favorite parts of reality right now, especially. Dope answer, brother. Uh, I knew you fucking brought it. Uh, first <laughs> episode, link down in the show notes, guys, and all the ways to find him, of course. Chris Matthew, welcoming you back. And this is what's nice about having you, because you're a uh, brother, of course, but having you back as far as the uh, episodes are concerned, is that we could skip all the foreplay and get straight to the penetration. So what hey. I want to know is about your forbidden doc. Do you mind if I like kind of radio voice this up for you? If I announce Do it. it. Go for it. The forbidden documentary, Occult Louisiana, episode one, older than history. That was good, man. I got a little chills on that one. Voice over shit for your shit next time. Hey, yeah. this is awesome. So this is why y'all came down. You were on your way through... Uh, to Louisiana here to shoot this thing and you shot a little bit of it here which I'm honored and grateful it looks amazing dude uh, tell me about this this is awesome this is something that I had inspiration to do through a, a series of psychedelic experiences actually and I uh, got the inspiration about a year and a half ago and it was just supposed to be a documentary just about some a collection of the weird shit that I'd covered over the years. But I decided that's not enough. This is, you know, I've, I've co covered way too much and there's so much in incredible fascinating information out there to share with everybody that I need to do a series. And I started planning on how I'm going to do it. Well, what better way than to actually travel to some of the most incredible historical conspiratorial paranormal sites across the United States, visit them myself, go check out what they have to offer, interview some local witnesses, people who have experienced the phenomena, people have written about it, experts, researchers, authors, put it all together in a beautiful package for all of you to enjoy and explore. And I thought what better place to start out than my home state of Louisiana. So that's what I did. I took a trip out to Louisiana in April. We stopped by your place in Texas, spent a night out there, and we went and explored some of the, the wonders of the swamps of Louisiana, from the plantations to New Orleans to some of the mound sites and some of the swamps and just some of the freaky woo-woo locations that I covered. And I 
got so much information. I found out so much about my home state of Louisiana that I had no idea about. It was supposed to be, again, just one episode about Louisiana, but this has turned into a whole season. So this is going to be about maybe two or three even episodes just about occult Louisiana and some of the crazy, insane things and wonderful things I found out about my state. What a badass project, man. And what a cool thing to do. Like, I don't know how many people want to go investigate the hauntings of their state and run through it like that, especially you not even being located in the state that you were from and you went back to to do this in. But what a dope ass thing to do, and especially your inspiration. I think that that's very interesting because that comes from a different place, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And I, I think I don't know where I couldn't tell you where it came from. It's somewhere deep inside my my subconscious. And I had gone to film school. I gone to full sale before way before long before I even started Forbidden Knowledge News. And it was a kind of forgotten skill that I had the, the ability to do editing and filmmaking and videography and stuff like that. I had used it somewhat when I was editing for my local uh, television station when I used to live in Louisiana. But then I just kind of put it all to the wayside and start until I started doing Forbidden Knowledge News, at least the video side of it. You have your your pro little projects that you do, especially with each episode. If you want to make it look decent, you're going to have some editing in it and you're going to include some graphics and stuff like that. So I had started integrating that into Forbidden Knowledge News and I thought, man, I've got these skills just sitting here. I know how to put together a feature film. Why not just get my ass in gear and do it? And I just I decided to do it and I'm so glad I did. I'm, I'm really thrilled with the results so far. So what is something for a young filmmaker, the first tip that you would give somebody setting out to do something like this, the first like mistake, I see that smile on your face. <laughs> What's a good one that you can be I'm like, still, man, I, I'm still going through mis the mistake phase, bro. It's like I'm making so I'm like learning from my mistakes. And I probably have a very unconventional style of putting everything together. I thought I would be able to storyboard everything and have a cohesive uh, outline of everything and an understanding beforehand of what would, what it was going to come out of this. And it didn't work that way. I got down there. I got all the footage together. I got all these awesome interviews and I just started to try and like storyboard it out and I couldn't do it. I was frustrated. I was like, this is not going to work for me. So I just started to just dive in and start putting like, blowing through it, basically channeling whatever was going to come out as I was editing, as I was just putting the music in piece by piece, it just started flowing together and it came out to a, a wonderful, cohesive in type of story uh, that I, I didn't have any idea of that it was going to turn out that way in the beginning, but I'm very happy with the way it did turn out. And I do consider it some sort of like channeling that I was doing during that process. So as far as advice for filmmakers, I don't know, because the, I was, I believe it was so unconventional. The, the process that I use, I don't know if anyone could re follow that logic or recreate it that way, but for me, I think I had to let go of any frustrations and I couldn't, I didn't, I had to take away all the pressure on myself. If I started to put pressure on myself, I have to do this then, I have to get this ready, I have to have all this done. And any the second I started putting pressure on myself and I started getting frustrated over things, it wouldn't flow correctly. Whenever I just let it go and treated it like a, a, a project, like a, a creative project and just something that I enjoyed doing and just sat down and let it happen, that was the best results, and that's how everything turned out. So cool. It, it comes back to that, doesn't it? And that's the advice we give for folks when we do this. It's like, dude, get out of your own way, and this shit just kind of flows in, and it's an awesome experience. So outstanding work, dude. Um, I want to know as well some of the freaky woo-woo that you found. So tell me the most interesting thing that you learned when you were doing this entire thing everything like <laughs> the stuff that i learned i had no idea about growing up there uh the only real legends that i'd heard about were some of the the cryptid creatures like the rugaru which is aka dog man it's the same thing as a werewolf and you'd hear stories about that growing up just 
basically cautionary tales. If you don't brush your teeth or you masturbate too much, the Rugaru will will come and rape you or get you. I don't know what the Rugaru was supposed to do, but apparently he he was a bad dude and he ate children or something. So that's as much as I knew about the legends growing up and, and until recently. But some of the most interesting things I found out besides some of the uh, cryptid encounters from the main witness that I interviewed, Scott Pace, which we'll get into in a little bit, those were incredible alone. I mean, the, that could have made the whole documentary itself just discussing those stories and encounters from this gentleman. But one of the most interesting things I found out is about the the history of behind the state that no one talks about and that even that has been updated since last year and you don't hear much about the what what you hear about louisiana culture from our ancient past is the native americans but the more and more we find out about our hidden history the more we realize that there were there were people here there were civilizations here long before what we understand as your native americans there was probably a global maritime culture that had very advanced skills at construction. And there's evidence of this throughout Louisiana and what they call the mounds and the the possibilities that there were very ancient civilizations known as mound builders that were putting these together. I had Dr. Gregory Little on and he has shared some very amazing information, some new discoveries. Now, I don't want to give too much away because I want people to find this out from the documentary, but the mounds in Louisiana, the age of the mounds that has just been recently rediscovered is incredible. And there is evidence that there was global civilizations there that had come up from South America and Peru to settle in those areas long before what we understand as Native Americans, very advanced building cultures, very advanced societies that knew how to build megalithic structures and possibly were built these mounds and they were the prototypes for things like the great pyramid so these civilizations could have been the the remnants of a of a civilization that existed before what we understand as the the ancient megalithic builders that constructed the great pyramids and those other megalithic sites around the world also, there's evidence that within these mounds, there were giant remains found. And what you hear from the mainstream, what's been covered up by the Smithsonian, is that they they admit that they find large skeletons in some of these mounds, six to seven and a half feet. But what they don't tell you is the thousands of newspaper articles that weren't covered up by the Smithsonian that you can still find out there. Not as much anymore with Google Erase and everything, but you can find these old newspaper articles from across the United States, from across these mound excavations that show evidence that 10, 12, 13, 15 foot skeletons were excavated from some of these mounds. And Dr. Little and others believe that some of these mound building societies, they either had very tall humanoids as their leaders and they worshiped them as gods or all across the board, life was a lot larger and every everyone was even including the animals and the plants and the trees was a lot larger than now, which is also very plausible. But that's fascinating because the age of the mounds has been updated to something that is older than we've ever documented before. Damn, that's interesting, man. I, I didn't know anything about the ancient mounds in Louisiana like that. Because you hear about the Serpent Mound and everything just north of you, north of that quite a bit. But still, uh, these ancient areas of settlement, <clears throat> we're told also that there's, you know, uh, that the seas were different back then. So is there anything that sort of extends just beyond Louisiana that's found out there in the Gulf, maybe that's connected to it? Yeah, there's speculation. There have been expeditions to look for remnants of the Atlantis civilization. And there's evidence that we have that there was very, very large, sophisticated 
vessels that were capable of traversing the globe that have been found in shipwreck that are very old and have been proven to be much older than we previously thought from academia and our known history to have been existing during those times. So there's there's some very interesting evidence of this possible Atlantis civilization that was residing in Louisiana, amongst some of those other places. Damn, dude. And what do you, what's your thought? And just going to sidetrack here, we'll come back, I promise. What are your thoughts on uh, the whole like ancient Egypt and everything was over here and the ties to that whole area of that there being an actual ancient culture, like Greece and everything was here rather than over there? And they talk about the Nile being really uh, the Mississippi River and all, mm, yeah. And, and the way DC's laid out all this interesting stuff. So, what are your thoughts on any of that? I think that's highly possible. I mean, like I said, even the remnants of the the advanced civilizations as we see in Egypt could have possibly coexisted with some of the the ancient civilizations and the mound builders that were that were residing here in the United States. But I think it's very possible, especially based on a lot of the new evidence that researchers are finding. Dr. Narco Longo, I'm sure you've you've heard some of his uh his recent discoveries about Florida and the possibilities of Atlantis civilizations there and all along the Gulf Coast and some of these massive evidence of massive shipwrecks and huge anchors bigger than we even have in modern times that are still lodged in surfaces along shores in Florida and the Gulf. So that's pretty cool. Bigger than we have vessels that would. Yes. Just, like ginormous, massive Nephilim type anchors that they don't know where they came from. And then it's wild because if you can create that type of thing, I mean, buoyancy is an interesting thing, but perhaps there's so much more technology in that. Maybe floating was just sort of an afterthought, you know, because even the uh, airship sightings of the 1800s that. Um, Secrets of Delshaw book uh, talks about Charles A. A. Delshaw's designs and things. Even those airships could land on water and things like that. Mm. They could also fly. So, it, you know, I mean, wow, what a cool ass thing, dude. That that's amazing. And yeah, I think we had a. Uh, it was a different type of. You, think, you know, you you look at it, um, ancient aliens, and they tell you that we had this extremely advanced type of technology beyond anything we could imagine today. I think. That we, it may have been considered a technology, but I don't think it was anything like we would understand a technology to be today, probably more energy and frequency based and something that we can integrate with everything in our natural world around us. But advanced, probably so, probably something that we wouldn't have created these days because of our modern control system and the aspects that are keeping us away from free energy, but. That's the a different story. <laughs> the way we're air quotes allowed to solve yeah. problems, right? When it's yeah. interesting too, what you said about uh, things being bigger back then. And we uh, talk about like the devil's tower. I know you've talked about this kind of stuff with the ancient trees, man, how they weren't mountains. They were these massive trees. <laughs> yeah. And have you ever seen that Sibs on Insta? Um, it, it's on Instagram, but it's called Sibs. S I M S E. I'm going to, I'll show you that profile. We'll pull it up here in a minute. But it's uh, it's it's all about these rocks being ancient beings that just sort of laid down and then just got covered and turned into these rocks and they even show like erosion and then like the I passed by one of those the other day, uh, profile rock in Colorado, in uh, headed towards it's in northern Colorado. I forget exactly where it is, but it looks like a giant head that is on the side of a mountain, like you said, that maybe a giant just like laid down and died. I don't know about that, but it's interesting to consider. Dude, this shit is fascinating to me, and I love this kind of stuff. Um, oh, this is it. All right, I'm going to pull this up, Darren, your thing. We're going to get back to your thing, I promise. All okay. good, brother. Oh, get out of here with this business. Okay, yeah, is it this it right here, this little thing? Yep, that is it. Dude. Yes, in the Poudre Canyon, yeah. How wild, right? It does. It <laughs> damn face. What does it look like from the front side? Uh, it, you, it looks a lot different than that. It's harder to tell what it is from, from the other side. Well, from the front side, it looks very similar. I don't I wish we could pull up more pictures of it, but yeah, man, it looks like a face. Wow. Definitely. It's this, so I guess that's sort of a different angle from it, but man, I mean, how interesting of a concept that to think about that. And especially what you said with the, uh, think like giants and stuff back then, what if there were less 
entities, but they were fucking huge. Like, let's say instead of billions of people, there were a few hundred thousand, but they were massive. And to them, like, trees were just big as Devil's Tower, and that was just the thing. And as we evolve in, you know, time, we devolve or entropy occurs, and then we shatter not only our consciousness into more fragmented pieces of ourselves, but literal shattering of our consciousness into physical manifestations of that into the form of much more people, but they're a lot smaller. Mm. What do you think? I, I, th I think it's interesting. You were, we were talking about Jason Brashears earlier, how you'd like to get, have him on. And he talks about something called the vapor canopy, yes. which was something having to do with our environment that caused the, and then our atmosphere that caused everything to be much larger. And he believes that one time it collapsed, which in turn turned everything much smaller and that provided, you know, modern humans. But as far as giants and the evidence of giants, I mean, even until recently, I mean, you look at the, the story of the giant of Kandahar and the evidence that people are still having sightings and Recently, one that I even included in my documentary that Tony Merkel was telling me about that he, the, these two gentlemen were traveling through areas of Louisiana of the swamp that had just recently been opened up because of a large hurricane that came through the area and it opened up a channel that has not been explored in I don't know how long and forever. And he, they were out there and they, they swear peeking behind a tree about 15 to maybe taller maybe 20 foot tall there was a giant humanoid looking at them from behind the trees and of course they took out of there but it also connects to the other legends that i covered in the doc which is that of bigfoot my witness has seen bigfoot's reaching he claims up to 20 foot some taller he said he's seen some the size of a house which he couldn't believe he wouldn't have believed it if he didn't see it so and this guy, this Scott Pace, which we'll be talking about soon, I'm sure he is just your normal every day. He's not looking for notoriety. He didn't know anything about any of this stuff before he started having his experiences. Just a regular dude, down to earth, nice. He's a hunter in Louisiana, and he just had some incredible experiences that popped open his perception. Dude, so, his, yeah, his accounts are fascinating. So let's not tease it anymore, uh, please. <laughs> Scott Pace, tell us about this dude. It was fascinating, man. Yeah, Scott Pace. I came across him because someone recommended him to me because I had I was I always cover a lot of Bigfoot stuff, and he's from Louisiana. So I got in touch with him, started talking, and he started telling me some of his counters, and I could just tell that he re truly believed these these experiences that he had, and that for one is enough for me to take an interest in it. And I had him on and he talked about these incredible encounters and I'm going to get into these. But again, he I don't think like he's trying to do this for attention. I, I think that he truly believes his stories and that that alone leads me to want to investigate more. So it all started for good old Scott about a year and a half ago, and he was hunting. He was in a, a deer blind, which is a, just a, a little elevated stand that you go to to hunt deer. And he was sitting there, and all of a sudden he got this strange feeling, and his rifle started like vibrating. And he looked out the his his deer blind. He looked out the the little window, and he said he saw in the brush what looked like a a humanoid, a hairy humanoid. So he, he took out his phone and snapped a picture. And in the picture, he could see it. He said it was looked like a massive being standing on two legs. So he picked up his rifle and he's looking through the scope at it because he can he can see it a lot closer up. And he says it's the most it's the hugest humanoid man he's ever seen, but he's got black skin. He's about eight foot tall and he's got dreadlocks and matted hair covering his whole body, black dreadlocks and matted hair, just covering everything. And he's got pitch black skin. And then he senses that there's something else there. So he pans his rifle over and he sees what he can only describe as a wolf man, a, he said it looked like a very tall basketball player with long, lanky arms. But when he got to the head, it was a full on dog head full of hair. He's terrified. And then 
on top of all of that, he starts he starts hearing communication. These beings start telepathically speaking with him. He says at first he could tell it's the werewolves or the dog man, Rugaru, speaking to him. And he says, if you don't put that gun down, I'm going to come up to that blind and tear it apart and kill you. And then he hears a distinct other type of voice in his head say, no, he's not trying to hurt us. He's just looking at us. Don't do that. And Scott's freaking out. He doesn't know what to do. So he tries to, you know, mind speak, which he calls it himself. He tries to mind speak to these two to these two beings telepathically. And he says, I'm not here to hurt you. I was just looking. I'm going to leave. And then he hears this other audible voice that said it sounded like it was a a different being because he could somehow you can tell the difference between who is speaking with you, of course. And it it said, get out of here. So he just grabbed everything. He hauled tail out of there. And on his way out, he looks behind him and he says he sees not only the Bigfoot and the other dog man creature that is following him out, but two or three other very large, hairy humanoid creatures following him out. He can't make out exactly what they are, but it seemed like they were making sure he left. Now, after this experience, he left and, you know, just hauled ass out of there. But after this experience, it must have cracked something open in his perception or these beings found an interest in him, but he started having experiences. He started hearing more speaking uh, in his mind from what he believes to be Bigfoot creatures. And then it evolved to they started going into his house at night. He'd he'd hear footsteps. He'd see indentions in the floor. His doors would be wide open. He'd he'd even see Bigfoot's peeking into his windows Uh, He lives very close to the swamps in the very rural area. So he started very becoming very curious about this. Now, he never had any negative experiences besides that first experience where the dog man was uh, threatening him because he I don't think he had any further experiences with dog men that he can that he can remember in his waking uh, reality, which that gets weirder later. (laughs) So. He starts having experiences. He starts going out into the the wilderness areas surrounding his house. And he is a he's also a very religious man. He's a church going man. So he approaches it from a very religious lens and he goes out there with his Bible and he starts <laughs> he starts reading his Bible and quoting his Bible to these beings. And he said that they would he would see them poke poke their head out from behind trees and look at them. He said, it's very rare that you would ever see these beings full on. He says, you will mostly see shadows, eye shine, and every once in a while you could see them poking behind the trees. He says that there's one. He eventually uh, hooked up with a group of other people who've experienced this stuff and they go out together and they have these insane experiences where they, they can contact these beings. There's one that he goes out with his group and they call this Bigfoot Stevie Wonder because he's going behind the trees like this and they see him peeking around like that and looking at them. And that evolved after the Bigfoots. He starts having all kinds of crazy experiences, not just with like swamp creatures and what he he said are the little forest people. I'll get to in a minute. Those are creepy as fuck. The little forest people. I don't want to come across one of those they things. Already sound creepy. Yeah. And then he said that, well, <laughs> he's had he had experiences with extraterrestrials and that's more recent. And they they were connected somehow to these Bigfoot encounters, which I'll get to in a minute. So, like I said, he starts going out with some of his his friends that have had these experiences. He hooks up with somebody in Nebraska who is a tribal leader who has a profound encounters. And he says, claims he's established a relationship with some of these creatures. So he goes out to Nebraska and this is the first time he encounters the little people, which he then later encountered in Louisiana, which that creeps me out to no end to know they're there. But they're probably everywhere if if what I understand is right. So the little people, he goes out with his tribal leader friend and they um, they proceed to see a, a very large humanoid creature. They believe it's a Bigfoot across a meadow. And Scott starts to telepathically communicate. He said, would you like me to sing for you? So he starts singing some gospel verses to this being. 
the being uh, then relays psychically that he approves and he he enjoys the music that he is being sung to. And then all of a sudden, these two, what he's, he describes as a smoke or mist beings come out of the ground and start like dancing like a snake charm, like you're charming a snake to the music that he's singing. And these misty, smoky things come out of the ground on each side of the Bigfoot that is like dancing and listening to the music. And these smoke things... They form physical little four or five foot tall forest creatures after they fully form and come out of the ground. And he says he sees these two little hairy forest creatures sitting next to the Bigfoot and just enjoying the song that he's singing. He said that's the only time that he's really been able to see what these things look like. They're just they have black skin, black hair, but they're only four or five feet tall and they have the most terrifying eyes he's ever described. He said at night you can see all you can see is their eyes when they come out. They look like spinning kaleidoscopes. That's what he described them as. He says, all you will see will these are these like spinning eyeballs in the night that turn different colors like red and green and yellow. And it depends on their mood that they can change their eye color, which is incredibly creepy. And he says they're not only in the ground and they pop out of the ground, they come out of underground. They can turn into mist and smoke at will, but they hang out in the trees and you see the eye shine in the trees of these creatures. So forest people, really super creepy. And eventually he had a, a, a very insane experience that other people witnessed where they were there with him that he saw a, a beam of light shoot down from the sky, open up, I shit you not, a portal. And two seven foot tall light beings proceed to step out and walk across the meadow where they were sitting in his vehicle. And they didn't even, you know, bat an eye. They just walked across. They didn't notice that Scott was there. Scott was just sitting there with his jaw dropped watching this unfold before him. So that is just some of the incredible encounters that we'll be discussing in the Forbidden documentary. But, uh, yeah, Scott got blown wide open there. God, dude, what a fascinating dude, man. These encounters. When So when are we, the next question, when are we going out here to hang out with his Bigfoot people and the forest people? We'll go befriend them, man. I, f I feel like there's a lot of magic there. I think they're misunderstood. There is. He's never had like a, a really threatening or negative experience with these beings. He did say one time he was sitting in his truck he was looking at his phone and he swears to god a bigfoot reached in and tried to grab his phone out of his hand and he slapped its hand and he let it go and just kind of walked away like fuck so off, that's TV. we're not he, doing it yeah so he slapped his hand to keep him from grabbing his phone bigfoot just kind of walks off so he gets the closest of close encounters with these with these beings, man. They're like familiar. They're like playing pranks on him, which we hear this about a lot of these things. They're like fun. They're jovial. They could fuck with you, you know, nod or whatever. But it doesn't sound evil. Well, you know, like what you're yeah. saying. And especially because uh, of the choice of content that he was singing. It's not like he rolled up with some gangster rap. He <laughs> rolled up with gospel, which has J-bombs. If you're saying Jesus around... Some entities that don't want. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Around, we're heard, we're told that any of them, aliens, anything, can go away. I'm fascinated with just sort of this like Justice League of characters that are there. I mean, it looks like it started with sort of a Bigfoot on Dogman gangbang, but now it's like sort of a meeting place where like light beams occur. Is it, is it anything with the? Is it a particular area, or do you think it's him? Because I, I, I think it's the air. I think this stuff is happening all around the areas at all times. There is reports of because I've interviewed other witnesses from the area and they hear they hear the whoops from the Bigfoot. They see UFOs constantly in the swamps, orbs, lights. Some hear disembodied voices, see spirits and ghosts. I think that area is just like your paranormal Disneyland, kind of like Skinwalker Ranch, but it's just in the swamps. I love that so, so much crazy shit there happens that it's one of the delineations for Blue Book that we always make fun of, right? Swamp gas. Yeah. So yeah. The swamp gas, right? Oh, it's everything down there. Fucking swamp gas, man. It's all of it. They got all kinds of shit going on. It's so broad, but it's so interesting because there's such a variety of phenomena in that one area. It's very yeah, man. And he, well, eventually, and I haven't had him on to discuss his latest experience, but he did tell me he's going to come on and next week he's had an incredible experience that I'll just give you a little teaser about. He, he woke up with orbs flying around his room and then two 
very large blue humanoids approached him in his room and sat down and proceeded to just have a conversation with him. They said they sedated his 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 wife so she wouldn't wake up. His cat was freaking out and like running around the room, but they eventually calmed it down. And they had a conversation about the nature of reality for a couple of hours. So I've yet to have him on to discuss that one. But like I said, it started to evolve into different experiences. He started having what he understands as contact experiences, but they were very strange because he would have missing time during the afternoons and late evenings. And then he'd wake up the next day with memories, memories of sometimes walking through what he sees, what seems like dark catacombs or underground tunnels, but being escorted by seven, eight foot tall gray aliens and mantis beings. And they proceed to bring him to different chambers. And he says it seems like they are trying to teach him or it's some sort of training activity for him. He doesn't understand completely yet. But he also has seen and witnessed Bigfoot that uh, accompanying these extraterrestrials during these experiences that he'll recall the following day as kind of like a dreamlike experience, but he'd have this missing time associated with it. And they're, they're incredibly vivid when he does remember him and it's not like a normal dream. So he believes he's having now extraterrestrial encounters that are somehow connected with Bigfoot as well. And he has opened that, that third eye is squeegeed, right? <laughs> dude, he is just, so tapped in and so open and willing to receive it. And that's really yeah. what I'm hearing here is when you're explaining this, he started very small and he unlocked the door with intent by saying, look, I know I'm seeing two things that freak me the fuck out probably. And I do have a gun and I could fire, but that's not my intent. The whole time he did none of it with malice. And as he's looking down the scope of a weapon, not to be used as such, but a weapon of observation rather, then he has contact and can overhear and is almost included in this conversation. He believes that when they initiated the psychic contact, the psychic communication, that it it clicked something because he felt something change in his mind when that happened. Yeah, so then the question is, is it, was he already at the level to receive it and just sort of was in proximity when it was occurring and therefore he was in some sort of bubble where anyone in that area that's at that level, let's say, or open to receive that, can receive the message. And this is what you hear about a telepathic society, that there's no like secrets per se. You still have individuality, but everybody knows what everybody's thinking, right? Sort of. Mm. So this idea that maybe he was within this bubble, but I love the fact that maybe, like you said, it just, it pings something in him. And it seems like all serendipitous, right? I mean, he was there, it's synchronicity rather. He was there, he came to the blind, he sat down. Um, I think he'd said he took his jacket off, leaned the uh, gun over and he sat there and then the thing is shaking like crazy and when he goes to mm. grab it that's when he sees the shit exactly what you said but even in all this all of it uh, the situation of it like did he manifest that they were there or did he go out there because he knew they would be there and there was a psychic link already there in a way because the yeah. future you already knows that this encounter encounter is going to occur so it's just fascinating how all this stuff ties together and especially when you're talking about you know, including ESP and shit like this in it now, it's 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 more interesting now that he has a psychic connection with these different beings, but also now in dream states, he's being able to allow to remember missing time events of when like his Bigfoot friends introducing him to the gang. You know, it's really interesting because he's just leveling up in this thing. It is like some sort of rite of passage or initiation, like you said. Yeah, it's I, I he believes that once he initiated the the communication with him that it changed something in his consciousness and it, it's like whenever we have a, a belief in something and whenever we have an experience and it changes our paradigm to where we understand that this stuff is real maybe there is a connection to the the consciousness of the entity or paranormal that is trying to present itself to you and it's allowed to come through either more easily or more often because your your perception is more receptive to it because you've actually experienced it once yeah and it's almost like an uber ride for uh paranormal shit because it doesn't matter what the paranormal shit is when you're ready for it whoever's in the area will get the call and be like maybe it's bigfoot and they're like oh this guy's ready for it yeah he's just right down the road you want to take this call <laughs> Hanging out yeah. There. yeah we'll bang uh dog man here in a minute that's fine and then they go you know make this connection and now that's facilitated this psychic connection for this person who is ready and then same thing maybe just somebody's in the area and a ufo happens to be like 
two clicks away, whatever the fuck this is, right? And then they're just like, yeah, we're in the area, we'll swing by, this person needs it. And then yeet, and then they have their moment, and then they're gone. And it, But it plays a role in the observer that that gives it just enough. You know, it's just, just enough freaky woo-woo. Well, I mean, like, if you saw a 20-foot Bigfoot out in the uh, woods, Chris, like today, if you and I are walking around out there, we see this 20-foot Bigfoot hanging out with all these um, small forest people, like, how fast would just all of your shit dump into your pants like just how quickly would that occur or do you think that you'd be like wow that's pretty fucking cool and and could look at it and not be scared and run away like honestly like i, I don't know the answer well i think for me i have i've had enough of my own experiences and i've been in this type of weird realm for such a long time that i probably wouldn't have any fear over it uh, it, and, but I do believe that it, you know, it, it's possible it could open up another level of perception that I, that I haven't experienced before, but it is so weird with the Bigfoot because there's just such a physical aspect to it. And they seem to be just your normal foraging type of hominid humanoids at times. I've seen videos where they may not realize they're being filmed and they're just sitting there picking berries out of trees, foraging, just doing your your regular forest creature type stuff. But then they always had there's also the aspect of psychic communication, going through portals, being able to control our perception. These things make me wonder if yes, it is just your your flesh and blood hominid, but they're like the the sorcerers of the forest and swamps to where they have these advanced consciousness abilities. They have the knowledge of how to manipulate matter and what we would understand as magic, because that's something that they've always been able to tune into. Maybe they even know how to manipulate these this energy that surrounds us to where they can go through portals to different dimensions maybe they're from the different dimension and they just cross over because they like the berries and, and the different types of forest food and stuff like that but there's also accounts of like people finding what they believe is bigfoot poop so so if there is Bigfoot poop, that means it's eats. It's a flesh and blood type type creature that maybe it's just, you know, like a forest sorcerer, a magical Bigfoot man. But I like the idea of like that. It's a pet for aliens on the other side, right? It's some other dimension <laughs> and to let it outside to take a shit. They don't do it in its own dimension. They come to the toilet dimension. They say, go outside. Just go on to Earth. That shit means. there. Go to Earth. It goes and shits in the woods and just somebody happens to be out there. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, there is also the aspect that Scott believes the dog man is subservient to the Bigfoot based on some of the other accounts he's heard from other people to where if the dog, if the Bigfoot tells the dog man something the dog man listens he doesn't he doesn't fuck around with bigfoot so it's there seems to be some kind of like subservient relationship maybe the dog man is the pet of the bigfoot and the bigfoot is the pet of the alien I think it, it, that's the thing right there that's where my mom goes with it it's like uh you know when you only have one dog you're like oh well, let's get another other another dog you know you get your pet a pet and yeah. <laughs> that's what it feels like. And it lets both of the pets outside. Like our dogs and cats go out together. So dog man Sasquatch for them is just dogs and cats or whatever. And the mm. galactic beings just open a portal. And those two huge ones, that was one because their dog didn't come back. And they're like, ah, shit, we got to go find fucking Bigfoot and, and dog man out here because they're running around on earth. We got to wrangle them up. Now, the only other experience Scott had with a dog man was a creepy type of astral encounter where he had some missing time. He wakes up the next day and he remembers it wasn't just your normal dog, man. It was dressed like Anubis, like your Egyptian God of the, the, the dog God, the Anubis dog God. And it was doing something over his heart chakra. And he said that he felt like it was a, a malevolent entity. So he called upon Jesus and the dog man uh, entity just disappeared. Yeah. And then he woke up the next day. So that's an interesting encounter. It is. How fascinating. Because now you're just thinking that maybe it is just as simple as like uh, somebody's fancy poodle on the other side that they like paint the nails of. And then <laughs> they send it to Earth to go take a shit. And then Egyptians are just like, what the fuck? And then it just happens to hang out and enjoy it. Like these little poodles that get carried around. They love <laughs> yeah. the attention, right? And you can see this just being a complete misapprehension of a portal use of a shit house, which literally is this place. It's just like sort of where they let their Bigfoots roam and take shits. There just happens to be a bunch of humans here too. 
I like this idea. I think we're going to develop this further into probably a children's book, and we'll talk. About <laughs> yeah, there's also the more nefarious aspect that these are some kind of chim chimeras or genetically engineered creatures from our advanced ancient ancestors, some breakaway civilization, maybe even extraterrestrials that may have been mucking with different types of DNA to create these things. Uh, Tony Merkel has a guest that has had incredible astral experiences where he's encountered he's he claims to have encountered dogmen and Bigfoot at the same time in a different dimension in a different astral realm. Now, this dude has had incredible experiences. You'd have to go listen to Tony's uh, show, and he's he's done quite a few episodes on this character, and I forget his name, but. He basically travels through different realms, interacting with different beings and doing deeds for different types of either demonic or entities or different types of creatures. And he claims to have encountered Bigfoot and Dogman in these under other realms. And they ex they said they explained to him that what they are is a type of shapeshifter, type of lycanthrope that can shapeshift into any type of hominid animal type creature at will. And that sometimes you will see a Bigfoot that kind of looks like it has a dog man snout that was maybe trying to morph into a dog man, but had the Bigfoot programming, you know, caught up a little bit too much and didn't quite make it there or vice versa. The dog man's trying to morph into a Bigfoot, but he believes that these are just shape shifting interdimensional beings really you know it's still fascinating to think that they were some ancient hominid that just went under the radar but i agree with you that there's just something about them now the other thing and i've talked about this with alexander petikoff i had him on you remember the uh mm. pixel guy it's super cool dude and this dude and i were talking about this and i was like uh you know what if it is just something that is a shapeshifter but what it does is just like extraterrestrials the accounts of extra extraterrestrials with screen memory is turning into uh, things around here they just look odd like big owls or deer like in the case of intruders the bud, bud hopkins book there's a few different creatures they turn into but they're localized creatures to our realm you can recognize them and so you're like yeah 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 my thing was is what if in those areas the it, the thing shape-shifting is doing the same thing they're just mimicking a creature that either was once was there or should be there and just isn't and so it's weird to us but to them they're like dude this is indigenous we're supposed to blend in here why do we stand out so much it's mm. interesting because then that would offer both explanations it could simply be a hominid that went um just under the radar and blended into we still have a lot of expanse if you've driven through the pacific northwest you look up in the you're like yeah i could see how a little stevie wonder thing would be looking out from the uh, stevie wonder bigfoot up there and i you'd never find the damn thing so mm -hmm. it could be like a yes and it can be like an uh, again the same thing but also these shape-shifting creatures which is again more to the woo-woo side of stuff which is you have some fascinating accounts with this then it could also then be a yes and again to where it does mimic the things of the area because like you said they can mimic anything so if that's yeah that's the another like super weird thing i've had plenty of witnesses say that they've seen like bigfoot mimic a tree or a rock that he just blends in or just becomes a part of the background somehow whether it's controlling your perception or it is actually shifting into something i have no idea but they I've I've seen the pictures of what they claim to be, you know, you'll see the the little eyes in the face and like a, a tree branch or something that's coming. It's like, that's the Bigfoot. He's cloaking. I don't know what to think about that, but it's super fascinating that people have witnessed that. Imagine that, though, you're going to take a piss on a tree and really it's a Bigfoot. There's <laughs> all you coming up the trail and it's like, don't piss on me. Don't piss on me. Don't piss on me. You know, you're pissing and it's like, or it's a curious oh. Bigfoot. And he's like, ooh, pee on me. Yeah, like, oh, oh, yeah, I'm going to turn into that. I know this dude's got to pee. I'm into that. <laughs> Amazing, dude. How funny. Any of that on the documentary? No, no, no Bigfoot peeing or, or Bigfoot dong exploration or anything okay. like that. <laughs> Fascinating, man. Do it with Scott, with everything. Your your film's incredible. I mean, your first crack at this is just so well done. Like, you just did such an awesome job. And I know, you know, we're all here to watch you grow and expand. So this is the first of many. I'm, and, and grateful you have the bug for this because you're so great at all of these things. And the way that you're able to put it together and the visuals and all that. And in fact, that uh, clip that you have out, that 10-minute long one, I'm just going to link that down there 
right alongside how to find it. I'm actually also going to send you a trailer. I have like a legit trailer trailer. Well, let's that, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll send you okay. that as well. We'll link the trailer down there so that you guys can see it. But man, uh, fantastic job on this. And like you said, it's a series, which is even cooler, guys. So the forbidden documentary, Occult Louisiana, episode one, older than history. That's it. That is it. And Dude, I am about to uh, pop you a link to the trailer right in the chat here. So, Dude, awesome. Video version of this. I'm just going to play it in full at the end of this. So stick around at the end of this video and we will play that trailer. But also all of it's going to be linked down in the show description. Uh, so I'm curious in all of your travels, um, what was like the scariest place that you visited when you were out and about? Hmm. Well, uh, like. some of the most dense energy yeah. is in at the plantation homes. Definitely like 100 percent. I've I've visited those even growing up. I went on some of the tours and the tours are honestly some of them are really disrespectful and they get the facts wrong and it's very hokey. But still, the energy there is still there. And they've had plenty of people that have had sightings and actually witnessed ghosts and apparitions. But the energy is very powerful there. There's still reports of people that go there and just pass out out of nowhere. One of the, the creepiest accounts that even one of my good friends has seen recently visiting the Myrtles Plantation is the what the appears to be spirits or ghosts or apparitions of humans hanging from the trees on the property. So that's really freaking creepy. There's a lot of dark, dense energy that surrounds that. But even in the swamps, even if you go to any of the really rural areas, there's just something there that just you feel like there's something watching you. Yeah. You actually, it's hard to get into a good mood. And that is why, that's one of the reasons why I had to leave the state. There's just even surrounding the the city areas and more than more popu populated areas. There's just something there, this constant type of dense energy. I don't know if it's because we're below sea level, because of all the horrific uh, bloody history that occurred, slavery, or the even older history that we don't know about, but there's something about that state. Even when I cross over the state lines, the further, the closer I get to the Gulf, the, the denser and the more I can feel that energy. And I've had at least from the time I was a teenager to uh, the time I moved to Colorado, I've had at least 15 or 16 of the friends and people that I've grown up with either commit suicide or overdose because of depression or other types of problems that they were having because they felt stuck there or uh, the uh, any of the other various mental situations that they would cause down there. So unfortunately, there's got a lot of dark aspects to it. They've got a lot of great things. The food is amazing. The, the people are wonderful. I love going visit there. But as far as like creative outlets and uh, places of employment and career options, there isn't any. If you want to have a career doing something in the south of Louisiana, you're either going to be offshore for months at a time, not seeing your family. You'll make good money, but you're going to be in the middle of the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico and not having any interaction for months. So there's either that or going on a shrimp boat for months at a time. Either way, you're on the water away from people for a very long period of time, causes a lot of depression. People think that they'll have good careers, which they do. They're able to support their families. They're able to make a lot of money in a very short amount of time and have, you know, big houses and things are cheap down there. So they can that money will go a very long way for the people living there. But their lifestyle, because of it, is hindered and it causes a lot of depression. So that's the another dark kind of aspect of Louisiana. You know, but it almost feels like that there's um, certain karma to be paid off in in areas. Do you feel this mm. that, like dense area inner areas? Probably of so. Yeah have just some sort of karma and maybe like you incarnate in that area specifically to pay that off. And maybe it's sort of an expeditious way to level up if that's what's occurring, but also it's something that you can visit and maybe do the same thing in a sense where you can slough some of this stuff and not pick some of it up with you or something like that. Yeah, it was definitely different this time because this was my first time back after moving to Colorado somewhere where I actually 
feel like my energy belongs and it feels really good to be out here going back there knowing that yeah, I just wasn't supposed to, you know, live out the the rest of my adult life there. It it was different and I was able to handle the energy a lot differently and I was able to have a lot better time. But I think that's also why there's so much alcoholism down there is because people are trying to and drug addiction. People are trying to just numb that strange feeling they get. It's interesting. It's like super dense parts of the world. It's not that they're third world or shithole or anything like that. It's just mm. the energy centers from where they are demand a lot of you karmaically. You know, there's mm. a, a lot of experience, but it's dense to be had there. That's why it's interesting too. Like you said, once you leveled up and you weren't at that energy and you could recognize that that didn't resonate with you, you move to a place, I mean, literally higher, like eh, amazing. Yeah. Now you're yeah. free, but going back and visiting it, it's you, you definitely feel it. That's just interesting. Mm, yeah, it is. And I still have a lot of friends that are down there that still feel like they can't get out for some reason, like they're, they're not worthy of doing anything better for some reason. And that's just such an odd thing because I felt that way for a long time. I felt like I was supposed to just be doing my shitty corporate job. And, you know, that was my life. And th that's the way it is because that's the way that the world works. But, I, you know, of course, throughout all my experiences in doing this show and everything else, I realized that there's so much more to it and that there we can do anything that we want and that's what our lives are supposed to be about but so many people have not and may never realize that down there so it is um you know i, I feel for a lot of my friends down there and i hope that you know in some way they can they can rise above that that energy and even you know even my folks it uh they 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 got caught up in the the covid stuff real bad and they're living in a lot of fear now like residual fear because of that and you know I, of course i have a lot of resentment towards the globalists and elitists for that but you know you, there's not much that uh that we're going to be able to do on that front because it the damage on to them has already been done so it's it's very interesting man and there's a lot of stories to tell about louisiana still and i've got a lot more stuff to cover so Buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> well, then give us one more before we call it here. What's um, just one that you'd like to leave us with? Oh, let's see. I'll give you some previews of what will be going into the next one. <clears throat> of course, we're going to continue Scott's uh, saga with <laughs> Bigfoot, Dogman, and Extraterrestrials. But we're also going to dig deep into the pirate history and lore, some of the characters that were associated in pirate history, like Jean Lafitte, some of the areas, the historical areas and happenings that surrounded Jean Lafitte's actions and his um his intermingling's with our government and some of the lesser known things that happened there, as well as we're going to get into some voodoo history. We're going to talk about one of the primary characters associated with voodoo lore in Louisiana, Marie Laveau and the lesser known aspect that she was involved with heavy political spy craft. So that's going to be cool. We're going to talk about Louisiana mob history, some of the JFK happenings and plots that was going on during the, the 60s in that era and before some of the mob and dark type of uh, corrupt political things that were going on and still are going on in Louisiana. Let's see, we're going to talk slavery, the dark history, and of course, the haunted paranormal energy. So that's what we got to look forward to. Dude, what a cool breakdown. What a great series. Pirates. I, I didn't even think to think about pirates out there, dude, but it's now a whole yeah. new rabbit hole that I have got to hear <laughs> about from you. What an awesome yeah. like dais that you have lined up for this exploratorily. Uh, just so proud of you, brother. Again, man, just can't congratulate you, brother. You enough on the that. checks in the mail for that too. Oh, shit. <laughs> and you know, and then grateful for the cameo in that thing too. Thanks for giving a show. Hell yeah! But uh, guys, all the ways to find him located down in the show notes. Dear friend and brother, Chris Matthew, Forbidden Knowledge News. My man, thank you so much. Thank you, Brandon. We're gonna have to do this again soon. Always a wonderful time. Just want to take a moment and thank our brother, Chris Matthew, for coming by and just blowing our minds, as always, with this fantastic information. We cannot look more forward to the rest of this project and to watch you grow as a filmmaker, dude. You're absolutely crushing it, man. 
So the forbidden documentary, Occult Louisiana, episode one, older than history, absolutely located down in the show description, guys. Check that out. Fantastic. Located down in the show description as well is our aligned partnerships. Now, these are the folks that we have partnered with to make this place better. These are resources for you guys to reach out to that we align with, and that's the whole point of the project, right? So, of course, first of all, our longest running, we have Food Forest Abundance. As well, if you have had any paranormal activity, any missing time, any freaky woo-woo stuff, reach out to Opus, the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support. They absolutely can help you out. Also, if you're ready to level up the Manifestor's Guide with Dewey Taylor, that's that was a huge turning point for me. I'm about a year into it now, and holy shit. Make sure you guys check the link for that. Also, uh, Coherent Spaces. There is this WISH unit, the World Integrity Space Harmonizer, that goes out as a pulse on all of these episodes. It is rebalance the energies in our entire home. Highly recommend you guys pick one up as well if that sounds like something that you're interested in there. And that link can be found down in the show description. Also, if you just want to detox your body, your physical vessel that you're running around out here, Christian Yordanov, the expert in this, has offered you guys a 30% off discount for his detox workshop. Cleanse that, cleanse that vessel, folks, and he can absolutely help you out. Now, also want to just uh, throw out Dr. Edith Umbutu Chan's uh, project here that we are a part of the Luminous Education Revolution. We had an incredible conversation that is streamed on this platform, so you guys can find it in all the places you find this. You can find that disclosure event that we had. It was a little over two hour live that we did with, uh, she had an amazing presentation, as well as a question and answer section, discussion session section at the end. So if that sounds like something that's a calling for y'all and you wanna be a part of it, please reach out and sign up with that link located below. And as well, we have the Conscious Awakening Network. We are doing a two hour spot over there every Friday evening from eight to 10 central, that's PM. And uh, come come hang out with us tonight actually on this evening's installment, we will be having Christopher the Astro Medium. Come hang out with us guys, he's always a delight and can't wait to talk about his new podcast that he has that I was a guest on and uh, we'll let you know when that gets released. So. Go out into this incredibly beautiful place, this magically mysterious place, whatever the fuck this thing is, guys, and y'all pick up a piece of litter. Be nice to everybody that you come across, please, and thank you. Go ahead and get out of the left-hand lane if you've got somebody behind you that would prefer to go a little bit quicker than you would, and that's okay. And as well, and as always, and above anything else, go out into this incredibly beautiful, mysterious, and amazing place, and y'all just be fucking good to one another. That's it. Love you all very much. We will see you next time.